Hi everyone, my name is Jack Cohen. I am a teacher and an administrator at the Hebrew Academy High School. I want to contribute to this Lead Like a Warrior campaign during the 10 days of Tshuva by sharing with you an idea that we spent a little bit of time together with our seniors in, in the high school about Tshuva. See, I think most people are pretty excited to be doing Tshuva. You know, we've had Rosh Hashanah, we spent time in shul and it kind of launched us into these 10 days of teshuva. So I think tshuva is in the air, tis the season as they say. But I think many of us, maybe most of us, are at a bit of a loss for how to do teshuva. We'd like to change, we'd like to grow, we'd like to become better. We all recognize we can do better. But I think where most of us get stuck is, what are we supposed to do exactly? How, how do we become better? How do we change? One of the tragedies of, of, of tshuva is that it has these very high hopes, but when we don't know what to do, we kind of crash on the other side. And then we could tell ourselves, say, you know what, I tried, it didn't work, I wanted to change, I set out to do something different this year, I felt really bad about last year, but then we end up in the same place that we started, and we could be left with this kind of feeling of, mm, change is impossible. I'm just going to do the same thing I did last year. I'm kind of doomed to repeat these habits. Here's what I think is happening to, to many of us. When we want to change, when we feel bad about something we did in the past, we have a natural human instinct that we actually feel is holy, that we feel is kind of part of our religious service. And that instinct is guilt. Guilt is this negative burden, this feeling bad for something that we did, which we call bad. We say, I did bad, so now I feel bad. And that we hope that if we just feel bad for long enough, we're going to end up feeling better. Let's say in the morning, I was kind of grumpy. I didn't speak to my wife so nicely on my way to work. So as I walk out the door, I feel bad. I knew that was wrong. So I get in the car and on my drive to work, I feel bad that entire time. And then at some point in my day, I was like, you know what, I feel bad long enough. I made my wife feel bad. And now I feel bad. And so the two bads kind of even out. And then I was like, okay, I can feel good again. And that's the way guilt tends to work. It's almost two bads make a right, at least in our heads. The only problem is that I haven't become any better no positive changes happened. And I certainly didn't make my wife feel better. So the only thing that came out of it was, was, was more bad. I made her feel bad, I feel bad, and now I feel better, but I myself am not better and I have not made her feel any better. And so guilt in that sense kind of keeps things the same. It's not a productive emotion. But really guilt is actually worse than that. Guilt has a kind of branding effect. It's it labels me. I, 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 come out, I come away from that experience and I say, you know what? I'm a bad husband. And I kind of all day, I'm like, I'm a bad husband. I'm a bad husband. I'm a bad husband. And I tell myself that. Guess how bad husbands speak to their wives? Badly. And that's true for anybody. If you have a kid who gets branded at some point in middle school, something was going on in their lives and they get branded as bad students. So if, the, if that happens long enough and they tell themselves and they feel bad and I feel bad and therefore I'm a bad student, guess how bad students behave? Badly. People come up to me, they say, Rabbi, I'm a bad Jew. I do this and I don't keep that. I'm a bad Jew. If that's your narrative, if that's your story, if that's your label, you're going to keep acting that way. It is a self-fulfilling prophecy because you've decided, you've named, you've put a big label on yourself that that's what you are. So from this perspective, guilt is not only not productive, it's actually counterproductive, which is why parenting number one is if your kid, Shlomo, hits his sister, and you go to Shlomo, you say, Shlomo, how can you do that? You're such a bad boy. That is bad parenting is what it is. Because if Shlomo is told he's a bad boy, bad boys do bad things. Bad boys hit their sisters. So telling him he's a bad boy and making him feel bad is not going to help. 
it's only going to make matters worse. Of course, the correct way to do it, and this is something we have to all strive for as, as parents, as teachers, and even if, if there's any students watching, so jot this down because you will have to use this. The correct way to do it is say, Shlomo, you're such a good boy. How could such a good boy behave so badly? I expected so much more from you because you're such a good boy. That is a totally different way to do it. Now, instead of burdening Shlomo with negative emotions, with bad feelings, and with a negative label that is going is like a, a weight that's going to drag him down, I've actually awakened in him, hopefully, that buoyancy, that uplift of, Shlomo, you're a good boy. Good boys don't behave like this. And that's going to lift him up. Let's see if this perhaps different way to look at things can be applied to teshuva. I think it does. The Rambam, Maimonides, in his classic work on, on Halakha, the Mishneh Torah, he has a section in the first volume, which I think is one of the crown jewels of the Mishneh Torah, which is called Hilchot Tshuva, the laws of teshuva. And in it, he really breaks down teshuva, this thing that we all want to do, but maybe is a little bit ethereal, a little bit hazy, and therefore we get stuck not doing it or not doing it well, not doing it in an effective way. And he really breaks it down for us. In chapter two, the first halakha, he says something which confused me for a long time. He says, Ezehi teshuva gemura. What is complete teshuva? The full, the full shebang. What is it? And he goes and he explains that if someone's in the exact same situation as he was when he made a mistake at some point, and he's, he's at the same age, and it's the same circumstance, it's the same season, he's with the same people, and he doesn't do it, that's called complete teshuva. And then he says in, in halakha number two, umahi tshuva, what is tshuva? So I was always bothered. Why does he tell me what the gold standard of tshuva is? Complete tshuva, and then he says, by the way, what is tshuva? So what he's doing is, he's explained to you what we're going for. What we're going for is complete change. That even if a person was scientifically put in the exact same circumstances, with all the factors controlled, now he is different. The only thing that's changed is, is the person themselves. They are different because they went through the process. After telling us that's what we're shooting for, the Rambam then breaks it down. How do you get there? How does a person change in a way that's permanent? Now notice the steps. I'm going to walk through the steps. I'll do it in English so we don't trip up with the Hebrew. Notice how counterintuitive the Rambam steps are. Notice how he does not saddle the person with guilt in step one. Let's go for it. Step one, what is tshuva? The per first person, the person, the first thing the person should do is the person must stop doing the chet, must stop doing the bad thing, the bad behavior, the bad action, must cease from the behavior. Cease from the behavior? Cold turkey? Just like that? He changed his whole life just like that? No, that's not what the Rambam says. The Rambam says that a person needs to leave the behavior. Let's say a person's a smoker. So the person defines it, I'm a smoker and smokers smoke. So it's very hard to, cold, to quit cold turkey, but let's say you speak to the person and say, can you quit cold turkey? No. Can you quit for a year? A year? Are you crazy? I can't quit for a year. Can you quit for a month? A month? I don't think I can do a month. That's a long time. How about two weeks? Can you do two weeks? I think I can do two weeks. Okay. Let's stop for two weeks. Step number one. You, you simply stop the action. Step number two. Get rid of the thoughts. Get your thoughts on something else. Of course, it's very hard it's very hard to change your thoughts, but you can replace your thoughts. If I tell you to stop thinking about zebras, stop thinking about zebras, will you stop thinking about zebras? It's very hard to stop because the more you try to, to, to not think about the zebras, the more you think about zebras. You weren't even thinking about zebras, but now you are. But if I get you to think about elephants and how beautiful elephants are, and how magnificent and, and large and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and how beautiful their tusks are and their trunks, all of a sudden you're thinking about elephants, you're not thinking about zebras. So if you have a bad habit, maybe you should pick up a healthy habit instead. In Israel, they, instead of smoking, they, they chew sunflower seeds. That could help, right? 
Maybe there's more attractive habits than chewing sunflower seeds, but can you find something to get your mind off of the, the thing that you are doing? So that's step one and two. Step one is to stop doing the thing for as long as you can. Step number two is get your mind off it. And I call step one and step two sobering up. Notice that the Rambam did not go the way that most people go, which is, oh, you know how I'm gonna stop doing that action, this behavior? I'm gonna feel really bad about it. I'm gonna feel really, really, really bad about it for a really, really long time until I stop doing it. That doesn't work for the reasons we gave. Because when you feel really bad about it, you feel like you've atoned because you felt bad for it, and guess what you're gonna do? Once you feel like you've atoned, you're gonna go back to doing it. Once you don't feel like a bad husband, a bad son, a bad father, a, a bad teacher, because you feel like you felt bad long enough, you're gonna go back to doing it. And more than that, you're gonna go back to doing it because you are a bad father, a bad son, a bad student, a bad teacher, a bad Jew. You are those things. The Rambam says, forget that, forget that. Just, just sober up, pause, pause the action. Put it on pause, and put it aside. Get your mind on something else. That is step one and step two. Step number three. Step number three is make a decision to never do it again. So if you're able to sober up for a while and you don't, you're not doing it, you're not thinking about it, now and only now does the Rambam suggest, now make a real decision. Make a commitment about the future. The future? What about the past? I haven't even felt bad about the past yet. The Rambam says, don't, don't feel about the past yet. It's, if, even if you do, it's going to be fake. Again, an example with parenting. Your, your kid hits uh, the other kid. Another kid, not your kids, my kids, yeah? Not my kids, somebody else's kids. Shlomo, poor Shlomo. Shlomo kid hits his sister. Shlomo, I can't believe you hear your sister. Go say sorry, Don't you feel, tell her you feel bad. Ugh, sorry, tell her you feel bad. I feel so bad. It's insincere, it's meaningless. It's a meaningless sorry, it's a meaningless guilt because Shlomo's the same kid, he hasn't changed. He hasn't changed his behaviors, he hasn't changed his thoughts. So the Ram says differently, stop the behavior, get your mind on something else, don't think about the past yet, make a commitment about the future. Shlomo, Shlomo, we're gonna, we're gonna work together. We're not gonna do this anymore. We're not gonna do this anymore. Get Shlomo to, stop, to make a decision that says, Shlomo, you're a great kid. You're a great kid. Great kids don't do this. Let's work on never doing this again. We're never going to do that again. I'm not talking about the past yet. I'm talking only about the future. The strategy, psychologically, that the Rambam is employing is to get Shlomo to feel better, to get ourselves to feel like we can do this. We can change our actions. We can change our, we can get our minds off it. We can change our thought processes and we can make real commitment. Now, asterisk, the commitment is a commitment. The commitment is not fully real. We'll see in a moment when it becomes real. It's not fully real yet. That was step number three, commitment for the future. Step number four. Finally, 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 the Ramam says, now you can regret and you should regret your past behaviors. Because now, if you start over here, you were that bad Jew, that bad, bad husband, that bad father, that bad teacher, whatever. But now you've stopped the action, so you've actually moved away from that person. You've even managed to get your mind off of it. Now you feel like, wow, I'm, like, I'm a different person. I'm like, my mind is clearing. I'm no longer doing that bad thing. And now you make a commitment on the future. Now you've really advanced. You really look back and now you're able to say like, wow, I don't even recognize myself doing that. I can't believe I used to act that way. And this is true even if it's been a week, two weeks, three weeks, you can feel really good about yourself that you've taken these steps. And now when I feel regret, it's not guilt that's like landing on me and crushing me and pushing me down. It's remorse. It's, 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 it's a lack of recognition. It's like, I can't believe I used to behave that way. I don't even recognize the person that I was. Not that I feel bad about the person that I am. I don't recognize the person that I was. And now that is step four of the Rambam. Now it's no longer guilt. Now it's a surgical removal of identifying with those behaviors because I've successfully taken some serious steps away from those behaviors and now I'm able to look at them with some perspective and push them away. And now the Rambam says step five is that the person is able to hold that pose, hold that self-control, hold this behavioral and mental change for long enough 
that he says the one who knows the hidden, which is his way of referring to obviously Hashem, Kadosh Baruch Hu, God, the one who knows the hidden is able to testify about him that he will never do those things again. Wow. How are you supposed to know when, that, when you've reached that point? I guess we don't know. It needs God. God knows. But at some point, if a person does this process of stopping the behavior, getting it off their mind, getting their mind on something else, making, making commitment, their best shot as a commitment for the future, and then say, looking back and saying, wow, I don't recognize those behaviors. I don't recognize that person that I was. Then at some point, if you hold that, at a certain point, a person starts to change. Their identity, your identity can start to change at that point because now you have de-identified with that person. And if you hold that for long enough, we change. And if tshuva sounds esoteric, how about growing up? Growing up is something we can all relate to. We all had things that we did when we were kids, when we were teenagers, that we no longer recognize ourselves doing. And that's because we grew up. The process of tshuva is the process of growing, of growing up. And as we grow up, if we hold those behavioral changes, if we get our minds off it, if we're able to make commitments on the future, even though they're not fully real yet, they're gonna become real when we are able to de-identify and push away those, those behaviors and not recognize that former self. Now, at some point, we actually really change and we, it crystallizes, it becomes, it becomes real. At that point, and only at that point, Hashem objectively can say about us that we have changed. That is the process of growth. And the process of growth culminates for the Rambam with confession, vidui. Vidui is what we spend most of our, 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 our day of, on, uh, on Yom Kippur doing, verbalizing what we did. Verbalizing what we did. We do it during Slichot as well. We verbalize it. That's the final step for the Rambam. Because again, when Shlomo says, sorry, it doesn't mean anything. Words at the beginning, they need to mean something. Otherwise, you feel like you said sorry, but you didn't say sorry at all. The words come at the end of that process. <clears throat> and here's the thing. If you try to apologize too soon, your apology will not be an apology. It will be an excuse. I'm so sorry, I was just really angry, or you made me really angry, or I was really tired, I was really upset, or I was really, someone made me really frustrated. That's not an apology, that's not teshuva, that's an excuse. So either your words are meaningless or your words are actually offensive because you're actually justifying your behaviors. But when the words come at the end, as Rav Soloveitchik says at the end, what you think in your thought is not as powerful as what you say with your words. When you're finally able to verbalize, say, yes, I did that action and I'm sorry I did that action. And I, I can tell you right now, I'm never gonna do it again. I don't even recognize the person that I was, but I'm not running away from it. I did it. You voice it, you express it, just like when you express liquid out of a sponge, dirty liquid out of a sponge. Now you can express it, you, you're able to get it outside of yourself. You're able to externalize it and say, I would never do that thing. I don't recognize the person who did that thing. This is the strategy that the Rambam shares with us, which I think is magnificent. I think it's totally different from what we generally think about as tshuva. It's a process that instead of burdening us and labeling us with negative emotions and a negative identity, which will doom us to repeat it, the Rambam is teaching us to build up the best version of ourselves within, to identify with a person that's able to change with small steps, one step at a time, but we're able to change. And by the time we're able to, we actually look back and we regret, it's a real regret. It's a regret of saying, I don't recognize that. That is not the best version of me at all. I don't wanna be that, I don't wanna do that. And look at me, I've actually managed to stay away from that behavior for a couple weeks a few weeks, a month, two months, six months. And now I feel good about myself. Now I'm empowered and please God, we should take this approach, every one of us in our own way, in our own areas of life. Again, if whether we're teachers, whether we're parents, whether we're students. And we take this approach and we build ourselves up in a positive way. We do positive tshuva, a tshuva that comes from love of Hashem, of appreciation for Hashem, that He gives us this opportunity to change in a real way, that He gives us so many chances in life, and we should take those chances and we should run with it, and we should become the best versions of ourselves as individuals and as a school. Hebrew Academy right now is in a, in a process of, of tshuva, of growth, of positive growth, of positive growth, of positive speech, of positive messaging, and this lead like a like a warrior campaign is really a part of that. Hopefully we can all partner together, we can contribute in our way, 
to making Hebrew Academy the school that it really is in its heart and soul and, and become the school and the individuals, the teachers, the parents, the students that we're capable of being. Chag Sameach, Shana Tova, Gemar Chatima Tova, and all good things on our journeys to Tshuva, our journeys back to Hashem.